And the more I thought about it, I said, Easter's about Jesus. As long as I'm preaching about Jesus, uh, we're good. And uh, I think we, this message will lean toward Easter, but it's not traditional in any way. So I hope it blesses you all. But Guilty is a series that I designed out of the book of John, the Gospel of John. So I spoke to you guys before. I told you guys that, that in, in Bible school, they'll teach you that there's, there's four Gospels, but three of them are called Synoptic Gospels. Three of them are very similar. John's a little different. John says he's a kind of like a trial, like a court case. And basically, Jesus is on trial, and they're trying to decide if he is the Son of God. If he is guilty of, of blasphemy, or if he's the real thing in John's court case. And he calls up multiple, 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 multiple witnesses. Because we all know that there's nothing in a court case like an eyewitness. An eyewitness says they've seen it, and the, the jury believes it. So we're, we're bringing up, what I'm doing is I'm going to go through John's witnesses, and we're, we're digging them up. And first we went through, I, I skipped a little bit, and I went to chapter 2, and we talked about the wedding couple, the, the married couple that got married at Jesus, and when Jesus performed his first miracle, when he turned the water into wine, and then last week we went backwards, and we went into, into John the Baptist, John the Baptist in chapter 1, but this week we're going to go into some of Jesus' disciples, there's 12 of them, John doesn't go through all 12 of them, but he really points out in chapter 1, four of them, and we're going to talk about those four today, and then we're going to go to one in the end one towards the end. So we're going to talk about five of his disciples today. So John's whole court case, this whole book that he built was for one thing. It was so that we believe that Jesus, or anyone who read it, would believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So if you don't believe me, then what, who better to ask than John? John, why did you write the Gospel of John? I think he told me that it says exactly why he wrote it in John 20, verse 30. And it says, Now Jesus did many things, many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it's not just that we believe, but it's that we have life in his name. So many times Christians are born, and we walk around like, yeah, Jesus died for me. I'm so thankful. <laughs> no, like, you should be excited. You should say that with life and energy. Jesus died for you. He died for me. So John doesn't want us just to believe. He wants us to believe and have life. So in John's court case, we're trying to find out if Jesus is guilty. After John the Baptist leaves the stand, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, our defender is what I'm calling him. Our defense attorney is what I'm calling him in this case. John uses the word par parakletos, which is basically translated into the advocate or the counselor. But uh, the defense attorney, so John, John the Baptist leaves the stand, and the defense attorney comes, and he calls one of the, one of the disciples, one of the twelve, he calls Andrew. He says, Andrew, come to the stand. And he comes up and they... Andrew's the first disciple Jesus calls in the book of John. I'd like to tell you who he is, but we'll let Scripture do that too. Because Scripture tells things so much better than I do. John 2, 30, 35 says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this. So remember, at this time, they're John's disciples, not Jesus' disciples. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus returned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you? Where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came, and they saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour, 
one of the two who heard him John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So John tells us that Andrew, the first disciple that John mentions Jesus calling, Andrew, is Simon Peter's brother. So <laughs> nobody talks about Andrew. Everyone talks about Peter. Uh, I felt this. Have you ever felt that? Like nobody talks about me. It's always about my brother. It's always about my sister. It's always about my wife. Growing up, uh, I was popular. I was really good looking. I had perfect <laughs> hair. Uh, but, uh, but I was never Michael. Every time someone saw me, it was, oh, you're Kelly's brother. Your sister is the one in the wheelchair. Like, everywhere I went, that was it. It wasn't, you are the funniest guy I know. You have the most perfect hair. You have six-pack abs. You're the star of the basketball team. It was, you are Kelly's brother. <laughs> You're Kelly's brother. And Shelly, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was that no matter where we went. I remember one day, most of you guys know Jason Papua. One year I took my friend Black Mike, Michael Hardaway, some of you guys know him. I took him to get church camp. And Mike was the same as Kelly, Black. If, Mike, if they knew Mike and they saw me as high, I'm glad to see you. But that's, that's the other Mike. Like, I want to talk to him. So, <laughs> so one year I took Mike to camp, and, and they all loved Mike. And after camp, we had the first rally at New Hope Church in Sunny Slope. And Jason Papawa comes up, and he says, hey, Michael, how you doing? Oh, my God, it's Mike. Oh, he's just giving Mike this big hug. So... Every time I see Jason Popwell, I always have to tell him, Black Mike's doing good without him even asking me because he did that to me one day. But you guys know what I'm talking about. So Andrew was the lesser known of the, of the two, obviously, because Peter liked to say stupid stuff, put his foot in his mouth, cut people's ear off, and do dumb things. But Andrew, and the thing about Andrew is Andrew actually led Peter to Christ. So we have Peter because of Andrew. Yeah. So even when you feel lesser known, you can find something about yourself. You're just as important as that other person. Yeah. You are loved too, and you are appreciated, and you are important. And that none of that was in my notes. It was all for free. I don't know why I went there, but there you go. Andrew was Peter's brother. So here's a defense attorney, the Holy Spirit, our advocate calls Andrew to the stand, and, he, and his first question to Andrew is, why is it you decided to follow this man? And Andrew, Andrew laughs and says, well, first it was simply because John, who you refer to as John the Baptist, he told me that Jesus was the Lamb of God. I had no idea what that meant, but I was just a fisherman. But somehow the Lamb of God, that title that John who I had been following, that, that, that title just seemed important to me. So I thought maybe I should get to know this guy. I began to follow him because I was interested in what he was all about. I remember his first words to me. What are you seeking? I couldn't tell him. What I was seeking, that I was seeking a savior. I couldn't tell some man that. So I didn't even really know what I was seeking myself. I just said, uh, where are you staying? <laughs> he could have just told me and ended it that, at that. Jesus could have said, I'm staying up the road and walked away. But Jesus had ways of knowing exactly what we were thinking. And I believe he knew that I, I was looking for something more. He said, come, and you'll see. I spent the whole day with him. The whole day. And by day's end, I just knew he was it. Maybe I'm a poor witness. But all I can say is, just a little talk. Just a little walk with Jesus. And I was convinced. You would be too. If you just gave him a little time. I was so convinced after one day 
but I had to run and get my brother. And that's John's, that's Andrew's testimony. That's his answer when the Holy Spirit says, why did you decide to follow this man? I want to interrupt though. I want to interrupt Andrew's statement because I wanted to say that maybe you're here today because you're supposed to be. It's Easter, right? We're supposed to be at church on Easter. Maybe you've never really committed. You come to church because it's the right thing to do. Because you've been taught. Because mom and dad want you to. I want to tell you this. Nothing will teach you the validity of Jesus like giving him a try. John knew that, or Andrew knew after one day that he wanted to follow this guy. That this guy was something special. That this guy was it. Nothing will teach you like giving him a try. Nothing will convince you that he's the son of God like giving him some time. You make a commitment, you pray every day, and you begin to study his word, and I promise you, if you do this for just a week, you will believe. Just like Andrew, we used to sing, let us have a little talk with Jesus. That song meant nothing to me when I was a kid, but now as I study scripture and I see stories like Andrew's, where he just walked with Jesus for a little bit, and... All of a sudden, he believed. I'm telling you, now that I've seen someone just say, I'm going to give them a try. I'm just going to do this Christian thing for just a couple weeks. And I see their life change. Just a little talk, just a little time, just a little bit of commitment will change your life. Let's continue to read John 1. John 1 says, 41 says, He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Jesus will change who you are. <laughs> Peter has been called the Simon his whole life. And in one interaction with Jesus. And nobody calls him Simon anymore. Jesus will change who you are. He will change what you do. He will change everything about you. Knowing what I know about Peter and Andrew, I'm sure that Andrew had trouble trying to convince Peter of anything. Peter was a bit like me. Cocky, arrogant, hard-headed. He had a mind of his own. He was outspoken. But despite everything Andrew knew about Peter, despite the fact that he probably thought that Peter was just going to laugh at him and cause a big scene, Andrew did what he never would have done before meeting Jesus. So we already see that I think, what I think, May have been a change in Andrew. And then Peter meets Jesus, and immediately Jesus changes him too. Let's call Peter to the stand. Again, it says, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So we call Peter to the stand. And Peter's testimony is one of my favorite. And we stopped at the beginning today because we're going to get into more of Peter's testimony later on in this series. But the advocate looks Peter in the eye and he says, it's Simon, right? Peter says, wow, no one has called me Simon in years. Not years. I don't think anyone called me that since, well, since I met Jesus. Jesus changed my name. It was definitely strange. He told me you are Simon, but I'm going to call you Cephas. It was one of the first things he told me. Imagine meeting a guy, telling him your name, and him saying, no, I think I'll call you George instead. Normally, I would have said something. God knows I have a reputation for putting my foot in my mouth. 
But with Jesus, it was different. I didn't want to yell at him. I didn't want to tell him, dude, you're an idiot. My name's Simon. Like I would have told so many other people. I didn't want to tell Jesus that. There was something about him that changed me. I wanted to tell him so much, but I couldn't. Jesus would say, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's true. But when I was around him, somehow my flesh was straightened. I could hold my temper. I could bite my tongue. I was different around him. He changed my name, but that wasn't all that he changed. He changed me. Peter's testimony, I'm going to interrupt you again. Peter's testimony, just that part is strong enough. And I'm paraphrasing, I wrote down Jesus, Peter's testimony, but it's right out of scripture. I mean, it tells, his, his, I just put it in our words, guys. If you just read the story, and that's exactly what Peter was doing. He didn't say nothing when Jesus changed his name. There are things that you don't like about you. I won't call them out. I could list a lot of your failures, guys. I know all of you very, very personally. I could list my failures. You guys could list my failures. But the point is this. There are things that we don't like about ourselves. I'll tell you this. If you don't like them, others hate them. But no matter how much you hate it, no matter how much you want to change it, you struggle. I'm here today to tell you that when you give him a chance, when you dedicate yourself to Jesus, when you say it's all about you, nothing about me, God will begin to see a new, God will begin to create a new you. Scripture tells us that in Christ we are a new creation. He will change those things that you don't like. That I'm telling you, if you don't like them, others hate them. You want them to change. Jesus will do it. And he did that for Peter. Those things we're talking about begin to change. It's not instantaneous, but God will change you over time. And one day you're like, whoa, I haven't done that in years. That used to be a really bad habit of mine. God must have done it because I tried for years and couldn't have. There's only two things, man. There's only two things that will ever change things that you try to change and can't change. There's only two things, a woman and God. Like you marry a woman and those things that, that, that people don't like about you, she will make you stop doing them. Somehow, God does it a lot nicer. <laughs> Somehow, God does it a lot, a lot nicer. A lot, a lot better. Trust me. But, there's only two. So, God will change you. Let's go on to John 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Peter and Philip, and he found... I'm sorry, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. There's a pattern here. We won't call Philip to the stand because Philip will tell you exactly what Andrew already did. I spent a little time with this man. I knew he was the son of God so much that I had to go tell others. So we see that Andrew, when he met Jesus, he immediately wanted to go tell Peter. And Philip, when he meets Jesus, he immediately wants to go tell Nathaniel. Andrew ran to Peter. Philip ran to Nathaniel. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel gives us one of the funniest lines of all the Bible. 
this line right here. To me, it makes me laugh because I know the whole story. Jesus of Nazareth. I, I don't know if, if Nathaniel meant to be funny or if Nathaniel was uh, just didn't know what he was talking about or Nathaniel was just being serious. But in verse 46, Nathaniel said to him, Can't anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So many times when I share this scripture, I tell you guys, Nazareth was like Buckeye. So, <laughs> like, Nazareth was like Buckeye or Apache Junction. So, Jesus, and so when, when Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth, we can imagine him saying, Apache Junction? There's nothing but trailers there. Anything good come out of there? Or Buckeye? Doesn't that place smell like cows? That's what Nazareth said. That's what Nazareth obviously meant to Nathaniel. So we call Nathaniel to the stand. What did you and, and the advocate asked this? What did you think when you first met Jesus? Nathaniel said, ah. Oh. Philip told me that he was the guy that he had read about, that we had read about our entire lives. I didn't believe him. He's from Nazareth. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. Nazareth is like trailer parks and ghettos. Nazareth is carpenters and farmers and rednecks. I asked Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip asked to come ask me to come see. For some reason, I don't know why, but I thought maybe I'd get some good laughs in if I went. I wasn't going because I thought he was the son of God. Like I told you, I thought nothing good would come out of Nazareth. I just came to laugh at this guy. As I'm walking toward him, he said, Behold, an Israelite, indeed in whom there is no deceit. I'm kind of known for my honesty. But how did he know? I've never met this man before. I wasn't sure how he knew, so I asked him. I said, how do you know me? He told me that I had been sitting under a fig tree. I thought maybe I had sat on a fig and stained my clothes. Or perhaps there was a leaf stuck on my clothes. I looked around everything. There was nothing. I told him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He laughed at me and said, because I told you, I saw you under a fig tree, you believe? You'll see greater things than these. So Peter's in Nathaniel's testimony. Nathaniel believed because of some little, tiny, itty bitty thing. Because he saw him under a fig tree. We've seen greater things than these guys. You've seen greater things than somebody telling you where you were sitting earlier. But does it, has it really shook your faith? Has it really caused you to root? Has it really caused you to change? Because it changed Nathaniel just this little tiny thing. You'll notice I didn't share with you today, Andrew. You notice I didn't share with you today, Andrew, Peter, Philip, or Nathaniel's whole story. I didn't share with you their whole testimony. I stopped just after Jesus had met them. They all had so much to say, but I wanted you to see that they had to make a decision to give Jesus a chance before they saw the big things, before they saw the change, before they saw what Jesus could really do for them. When it wasn't about what he could do for them is when they decided to follow him. So many times we in church, we Christians, we want to call God when we need Him. When when he, we need something big, when someone's dying, 
when someone's sick, when I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills this week. Maybe we should have called on him before it got to that point. Maybe we should have given him that little talk, that little walk that Andrew gave him before we got to this point. The little, the little commitment of, wow, you can do little things. Maybe you can do big things that Nathaniel gave him. They all had so much more to see. But their decision was made before they saw it. Jesus hasn't even done anything yet, and they're already sharing the gospel. Jesus has done a lot for you. Have you shared the gospel? Do you have disciples? Are you leading up somebody? Because most Christians will say, no, I'm not. I haven't done it. I don't really get it. I don't know how to. Everyone knows I'm a Christian, but I don't lead them to Jesus. It's probably because you haven't made that commitment. Probably because you're that guy that just talked about that. Only calls to him when you really, really need him. Jesus wants so much more than us to call on him when we really, really need him. They, they're already winning souls. And they barely met him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new come. They weren't ashamed. They weren't. These guys, Philip and Nathaniel, knew about the Old Testament. They probably went to church, the temple, their whole life. They knew Jewish stuff. They left all that to follow Jesus. So they're, they're scared, guilty there. I can't say this to people. All that disappeared and they already have begun sharing about Jesus. It was already important. When you let Jesus change you, Jesus will change you. For some of us, that's enough. We have gotten to know him and we've seen blessings. We have, we have dedicated our lives to him. And that's enough. But Jesus tells Nathaniel something that is kind of interesting. He says, Jesus goes on, he says, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So Jesus tells him at this point, you're going to see me go up to heaven. You're going to see I'm the Son of God. You're going to see amazing things. Like, you, me seeing you under a fig tree is nothing. Me paying that bill that you thought you weren't going to pay, that's nothing. I just had Biden write a check. That's what God says. God says, that's a stimulus. That wasn't a stimulus. That was a gift for me. Like, I did that. You think that you have some dumb politician giving away too much money, but I'm in charge. I'm your blessings. I'm paying those bills. I'm taking care of this stuff. You need to get that. It's me. Even when you're like, this is a waste. Even when you're like, that shouldn't have happened. I got you. I'm taking care of you. I know where you've been. I know you're under that big tree. And I know where you're going. I know you're going to see me ascend to heaven. I know where you've been. And I know where you're going. Jesus knows you. We all know the story. Jesus went on to gain quite a few followers. He had a huge crowd everywhere he went. But there were 12. That's a miracle in itself. I'm telling you, to be a man in your 30s with 12 good friends, that doesn't exist. I know nobody who has 12 good friends. But Jesus had a huge crowd. Then he had 12 good friends that were particularly special. He called them his disciples. Some of them believed wholeheartedly. Some followed because it was a popular thing to do. Some went because they thought it was the right thing to do. And some didn't quite know what they believed yet. Even in the 12, they had mixed emotions. I feel like Christians today are the same way. 
Some come to church when it's convenient because it's the right thing to do. Because I'll make mom happy. I'll make dad think that his prayers came true. It's the right thing. So I'll do it. Can I tell you? Jesus wants you all in. He wants you all in. As I said before, the crowds, they loved him. They loved him, but I don't think they were all in. In fact, as he entered Jerusalem for his Passover, we see this in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And it says, They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their, clo their cloaks and said, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others put branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. They didn't have asphalt, guys. They had dirt roads. Like nasty dirt roads. And Jesus is coming in on a donkey. And these people loved them so much. They took their clothes off and laid them on the road. So Jesus didn't have to walk in the dirt. They took their clothes off. Then others, they're like, others were like, I'm not taking my clothes off. I'll take this tree branch. And put it in. But they were waving branches. They were putting their clothes and the branches on the road. And they were yelling, Hosanna in the highest. Like, you're the greatest God. We love you. They were shouting to him. Son of David. Son of David insinuated that they knew he was from the lineage of David. And it tied back to Old Testament stuff that tells you they thought he was the son of God at this point. They thought he was the son of God. It was just a few days later, though, when this happened in John 18, it says, But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber, a thief. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns. And the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him. Crucify him. These guys who were praising him and calling him the son of David and singing Hosanna and taking their clothes and laying them in the road, laying branches and waving palm, we call it Palm Sunday, are now shouting, Crucify him. So many times we allow what? people think and what people do and what people say to affect what we believe because we are rooted enough Pilate I find it so interesting that one scripture says Pilate flagged, flogged him I mean he beat him and then he goes back in the room and I don't know what he does but then he comes back out and he says I find no guilt in this man oh you flog him man you find no guilt in because we do what we think is going to gain popularity. Because we want to be Peter and not Andrew. We want to be the person that everybody loves. We want all the attention. And God says, it shouldn't be about people's attention. You have mine. It shouldn't be about others. It shouldn't be about others' opinions, but my opinion. 
my opinion, is what's going to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. And the Bible tells us that not everybody's going to make it who calls himself a Christian. So are you sold out or are you one who's wavering because your roots you're not rooted in? Because you didn't commit from day one. Because you might only be here because it's the right thing to do. Because if that's you, it's time to root yourself. It's time to let God change you. The disciples let God change them from day one. And I think Christians today aren't doing that. We're letting God change us only for the good times. Only for the blessings. Only when we're lost. Only when we're stuck. We would rather make people happy. We'd rather flog an innocent man because it makes the crowd scream. It's not about people. So this isn't even a week later and the same people that had been praising him and wanting to kill him and let a thief go. They had been praising him just days before. And now they're yelling, crucify him. Not kill him, crucify him. Church, our faith has got to be stronger. Because when it's strong, when it's not, when it's strong, it's rooted. And when we're rooted, we know who we are in Christ. We've got to know who we are in Christ. We know the story when Jesus takes on, Jesus takes on a brutal beating on the cross. And he dies. At this point, even the faith of the disciples wavered. Peter denies him. They all run and hide. Mark at the Garden of, uh, Garden of Gethsemane, uh, most people believe it's Mark, runs off and leaves his clothes in the soldier's hands. He's butt naked, running through the Garden of Gethsemane. Like, that's Mark. Peter denies him. The only one that's there at the cross is John. Look, they're all gone. At this point, they're all gone. They all ran and hid. He beats death hell in the grave though. When they're not cheering him on, without them, we talked earlier about even the rocks will praise him, without them, they weren't on his side. Basically, at this point, he has John and Mary. That's what he has. And he goes and beats death, hell, and the grave. Do you know... When he beats hell, he takes the keys. <laughs> when you have the keys, you decide who goes in. <laughs> so it's not Satan who decides whether or not you're going to hell, but it's Jesus. So who are you going to praise? Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to lift up? God decides based on your faith where you're going. I want to call one last person to the stand. John 20, 24 says this. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin. The advocate, the advocate asked Thomas, Can you tell us why it is you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Thomas' story is a little bit different. He'd been following him for three years. But while Philip and Peter and Andrew all seemed to grasp their belief just the first time, right in the beginning. John Thomas was a little different. So when the advocate asked, can you tell us why you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Mary, John Thomas says this. He says, Mary and the other women had been, had seen him. They were on the way to take care of the body with perfumes and oils. They were the first to see that the body was missing. They went and told Peter and John. Those guys ran to the tomb. All they saw were linen cloths. They believed, but as John says in his gospel, verse 20, 8, 20 verse 8, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. But they didn't understand. 
They didn't get that he had risen until Mary saw Jesus. She told everyone he was alive. They were so excited. Can you see Mary? Guys, I'll stop here. Can you see Mary running around? He's alive! Like the guy who followed for three years is alive. Like exactly what he told us that we didn't get before. I understand it now. And he's alive. Like Jesus is alive. She, he wasn't like, hey Ron, can I tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? That wasn't what it was. It wasn't that way. I can't see Mary saying that. She was running around screaming, he's alive. He's alive, like, with excitement and cheer. But we seem to think we have to be all traditional. We have to be all, it's not about that, guys. He's alive. You can speak in today's language. <laughs> like, the Greek spoken in Greek, the Hebrew spoken in Hebrew. Like, we can speak it in today's language. We don't have to be, we don't have to tell the story like our great-grandpa told the story. We can share Jesus in an exciting way. Mary screams, he's alive. So they were, they were so excited, Thomas says. Then he showed up. He showed them his hands and his side. They all got to see him, but I, I wasn't there. I wasn't with them. I didn't believe. Despite spending three years with this man in ministry and seeing all I had seen, I guess my faith wasn't where it should have been. They told me, but I just couldn't believe someone could be deaf. I said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, we were in this room. The doors were locked. No one else was coming in. Honestly, we were kind of in hiding. Then all of a sudden, Jesus was there. It was like he walked through the walls or something. He told me, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I... I was like, he knew exactly what I had said. The first thing he told me was to put my hand in his hand and place my hand in his side. I had just said I wouldn't believe until I had done that. That made me believe. That meant that is why I decided to serve Jesus. It was like he knew. But I knew he wasn't there when I said that. I believe that instant. And then he said, he said this to me. He said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. <sighs> You'll never get to touch his hands on earth, guys. You'll never get a chance like I did. Is what Thomas would tell him. However, just like Andrew, Peter, and Philip, and Nathaniel, if you just give him some time, devote a little time to him, he'll shake your world. He'll make you a better person. You'll be blessed because you believed without touching his hands. You'll be blessed because you believed without all the blessings. You'll be blessed because you decided to serve him, not because it was the right thing to do, not because that's what people do on Easter, but because you served him, because you knew you needed him. Thomas says, don't wait like I did. I spent three years with him, and I was doing all the right things, but my faith wasn't rooted. I hadn't decided to serve him. So when I thought he, did, when, when I thought he was dead, my faith died. Church, your faith should be knowing that he's alive. Your faith should be, you know what, no matter what happens, 
no matter what looks dead, if life looks dead, if my plans and dreams look dead, if everything about me looks dead, I'm serving Jesus. When we decide that, that's when he blesses us. Jesus told Thomas, you'll be blessed more if you believe before I bless you, before you see the blessings, before all of this. The other four were blessed more than Thomas. So, if you're that guy saying, I'll believe when I see this. I'll believe when I'm a millionaire. I'll believe when my marriage is better. I'll believe when I don't have a broken down car. I believe when I can drive a car without a check engine light on. That's when I'll believe. I'll believe when my wife and I can go a week without arguing. I'll believe when my kids all have straight A's. That's what I believe. Jesus said, believe now. If you believe without seeing all that, then I'll give you all that. That's Jesus' story. So he's alive. We all know it. And that's the Easter story. But our faith is what really matters. Whether or not He's alive. If, it, if he's alive but our faith is dead, it's nothing. If he's alive but we haven't decided we're going to serve him with everything we have, it's nothing. We can't be half hearted Christians. We can't call ourselves Pentecostal and not have Pentecostal services. We can't, we can't be. The kind of people that the world has come to expect us to be. We have to be sold out, undignified Christians. David says, I'll become even more undignified than this. It doesn't matter what the world says, I'm serving Jesus. If everyone's telling me he's dead, I'm still serving him. I've made the decision... I'm not going to be the guy who went to church for three years but ends up in hell. That's not me. That's what we got to say. This is what I believe Thomas would tell us. Thomas would say, you have all the evidence you need. You need. You've seen so much. Just believe. Don't, don't wait until it's too late. Give it to him. Now. For one day... Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. So why not do it now? Don't wait until I make you. Don't wait until everyone has to do it. Do it now. I urge you, church, whether you're brand new in Christ or you've been serving Him for over 80 years, you need to make sure your roots are deep. Let's bow our heads. So how many of you can say, I haven't given him what he deserves. My faith isn't rooted like it should be. How many of you guys can, can say, I've been in church forever, but I don't think I have the kind of walk that Philip and Nathaniel had. I don't think I'm sold out like I should be. I know that some of you guys feel that way. You're like, I'm like Thomas, where I follow him and I'm in because I think I believe. But when the hard times hit, maybe I run away. Maybe I won't seek him. But I need to. I need, I need the blessings that come with serving him before I get into a mess. Before everyone tells me my dreams are dead, my, dream, my dreams need him now. Before everyone tells me my marriage is dead, my, my marriage is it now. I know that some of you guys, you guys can honestly say that. So if that's you, I just want you to pray with me as we pray this prayer. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that we believe. But we also see, Father, that maybe our beliefs aren't rooted enough. Maybe we need to dig in a little deeper. 
Maybe our worship should be a little more intenseful. Maybe we should be a little more excited when we tell people about you, God. We all realize our faults. So we pray that you begin to work in us, Father. You changed Peter from day one. And most of the people here today are people who, like Thomas, served you for years. And we haven't seen the change that maybe we desire. So, Lord, we don't need a name change, but we need, we need a, an attitude change sometimes. So we pray, God, that you just help us become the better, stronger, more rooted Christian father. The one who is sold out and dedicated to you. The one who, without a doubt, knows that we need you in every circumstance. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Help us with our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take communion. I'm sorry I'm a little late today. I told him it was too long. <laughs> but Jason and Josiah, come on up. God is so good. It's all about Jesus, guys. It's, I know... That wasn't the traditional message. I know it was a little different than what you're used to hearing. But the point is this. Jesus wants rooted Christians. Jesus doesn't want people who get excited when they hear the story and forget it when they go home. We already know the Easter story. Guys, we're, we're people who've been in church forever. We already know he died for us. That our sins are forgiven. We just need to give him what he deserves because of that. We should be calm. Sunday Christians. Not Good Friday Christians. Long Sunday Christians, not Good Friday Christians. Not Easter Christians. Because you know what Easter Christians are the people who I just told you. They're the people who got excited when they saw he had risen. I want people who are excited. I want people who are excited because they know he's going. He's going to resurrect things. He's going to change things. That's a Good Friday Christian. Maybe the only ones we find in the Bible are John and Mary. But with the season that we have in this church, we should be Good Friday Christians. We've got to be the ones who are believing even when times are bleak. Even when the stone is, is rolled, holding the, covering the hole, covering the stone, we should believe that his body was torn for us. It's not, oh, he's dead. It's, he died for me. They shouldn't have been saying that. Not he's dead, but he died for me. I got to watch. I don't know if you want to watch, but I'm telling you, they got to. They have the opportunity to see the skin get ripped off them for their healing. The body of Christ. What this bread represents, they actually saw. They should have been shouting Saturday Friday and Saturday. I got to see it. I'm healed. Isaiah, Old Testament scripture, says that by his stripes we are healed. They knew all this, but when their faith was shaken, they hid. This bread is for you. And don't let your don't let your circumstances shake your faith. Always believe that this bread is for you. That you are forgiven, that you are healed. 
always. Let's hear the breath. Bill told me I can't talk as much between the bread and, and the juice, so I'll just say this. If our body is healed, our circumstances are healed, our finances are healed because of the bread, our spirits are healed because of the blood. We are forgiven because his blood bled for us. He is the Lamb of God, our sacrifice. So, if you're thankful for that, let's take his blood in remembrance of what he did for us on Friday over 2,000 years ago. Father, be with us as we go this week into our own lives and protect us, Father.